morning or noon, everybody. Uh, it's a little weird not to be able to see you out there, and so um, I have no idea if I'm reaching you or if I'm totally confusing you unless you interrupt with a question. So don't consider it an interruption. Uh, simply chime in and say, hey, Bob, what the heck was that? And I can go back and do it again. And uh, if you're playing along on your own machines, which I encourage when I get into the live demo portion, um, it's really easy to be looking at your machine and not mine and miss a, a click or a link or something like that. So um, I'm happy to go back and repeat it for you because you may not be the only one who's uh, uh, looking at your screen and not mine at the moment. So uh, I want to start by acknowledging the, uh, the funders, mostly NHGRI, National Human Genome Research Institute. We have a, some money from some of these other uh, uh, people, uh, these other associations, and uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, initiated the project back in 2000 or 2001 with a grant to uh, uh, David Hausler, who's the, uh, the he's a co-PI on the grant, but he's the professor under whose umbrella we work. Uh, Jim Kent is the, the lead PI and team leader. He wrote the browser code. And I want to specifically acknowledge our QA people um, because they're the people who keep the browser running and make sure it gets broken on our test servers before it shows up in the public and you all get to see it broken. So they're really good at uh, troubleshooting and uh, backing up the work that the engineering team does and uh, the QA people uh, keep them honest essentially and make sure that they're kind of the lookouts. So they're the uh, uh, the advocates for the, uh, for the user end. And uh, I play a similar role. Uh, because I do most of the uh, public outreach. I give workshops and, and trainings and so forth. And so I get to talk to people uh, and hear what they want and get to see what, how they're working on the browser and so forth. And that helps us uh, enhance the, uh, um, the way the browser uh, looks and feels and try to keep, uh, keep it relevant for you all. Here we are on the central coast of California. We are across the bay from Monterey and across the mountain from San Jose. And here we are in the Redwoods. That's Jim, uh, our, uh, our team leader. And I don't usually point myself out, but there I am because you can't see me. And uh, that's uh, the Redwoods on Santa Cruz campus right there. Uh, we have a training channel. Uh, we have about a dozen or 15 uh, uh, videos. There's a shortcut to it here, but you can also get to it via our training page. If any of you are at uh, institutions uh, where you think uh, there's a larger group of people that might appreciate a workshop, um, you can contact us through the training page there and uh, we'll come uh, give a, a full day or a two-day workshop and uh, really get deep under the hood of the, of the browser. So what's the browser? Um, primarily it's a display engine. Uh, for genomic annotation. So anything with a coordinate can be mapped on the browser. We can put a little uh, link on there, put a little box on the browser, and then we can use it to click through to uh, other uh, resources. It provides a consistent interface across all genomes. Uh, in the uh, context of medical curation, uh, human and mouse may be the only genomes you're interested in, but we have 120 different genomes, uh, which collectively give us a conservation score, which can be useful. Uh, as you know, a, a a conserved nucleotide or a conserved amino acid in particular um, uh, gives us reason to believe that uh, uh, there's not a lot of variation permitted by the organism, uh, and so you can use that as uh, evidence for uh, 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 pathogenicity when the amino acid has been changed. Uh, it's also a tool that you can use in real time to ask questions, go to the browser and get your answers. Uh, in the old days when I was in grad school, you wonder idly at the bench about uh, whether a particular gene was expressed in some other organism, and then you'd go back to work knowing full well you were never going to figure it out unless you had a year to spend on it. Now you can spend a few minutes clicking around on the browser and get the answer in real time. So it can actually inform your decisions in real time when you do research or when you're uh, trying to figure out a, uh, an issue, uh, a question you might have when you're reading the literature. So here's a few things that I want to talk about today. Uh, we have another workshop planned in about a month's time. Um, we have a few other things uh, that I have planned for that. And uh, this uh, uh, presentation is being recorded so I can review it later, go back and see what it is I missed. Uh, but it's my hope to talk about um, a number of things here, how to get around in the browser, how to save and share your information, uh, uh, 
uh, using sessions, uh, how to load data into the browser as a way to keep track of particular locations, or load a whole VCF file if you're looking at uh, a full uh, individual or a trio, something like that. And also to talk about some useful data sets for uh, finding out what other people have said in the past about uh, uh, certain locations, uh, large and small variations, pathogenic and uh, benign, and uh, some data, um, uh, conservation data, and a number of other things. Uh, next time, I'll be talking about some of these other things. So here are two links that are worth uh, looking at. Uh, the genome.ucsc.edu is the browser itself. The second link is a link to some content that I intend to use today. And the third link is an advertisement for, um, uh, we have several positions open, uh, I think one or two at the browser, and then another two or three in our larger group that includes uh, um, other people who report to David Hausler that are not directly related to the browser itself. Um, variation, as you know, is the key to understanding uh, how genes work and how people differ from each other. Uh, you can see here is a, a Venn diagram that shows Watson and Venter um, and how they have 1.2 million of their variants in common and two or three million variants relative to the reference assembly. Here's the genome browser showing Watson and Venter, and the table browser here was used to um, pull out a, uh, uh, a separate data track that shows how Watson and Venter, uh, uh, their 1.2 million SNPs that they, um, where they intersect. Then these two uh, bits of data can be uh, used as the raw material for yet another query. And you could add in one of the other hundred or so uh, individual genomes that we have, uh, Archbishop Tutu or Marielin Creek. Uh, you could have Watson and Creek and Venter then. And uh, uh, you could use it for a trio, for example. You could, um, instead of doing the plus in the sense of where do they intersect, you could do a plus in the sense of uh, where are uh, all of the variants uh, of the two collectively. So you could have the father, the mother, and then the sum of the two parents. And then from that, you could subtract away, um, subtract that from the child and leaving you with a file, uh, a display of the variants that are de novo in the child. So if you have all of the childs and remove everything that they got from their parents, what's left is the de novo uh, variants, which uh, might be useful in interpreting uh, uh, genetic disease in the child. So here's that one-tenth of one percent of the genome uh, plotted to scale on the whole reference assembly. And uh, I'll just leave that as it is. Variants with phenotypic association, which is particularly important for this group. Um, you can see that none of the, this slide is a little bit old, so the sizes of the circles have changed, but the idea is the same, that uh, no one database has all of the variants that are present in all of them collectively. And in fact, at the time I, I made this slide, only uh, 2,000 of the 156,000 were present in all of the databases. So it'd be very easy to pick a database, pick a variant, and even though the variant was known, it might not be known in that database. What the genome browser lets us do is we update each of these data sets, typically on a weekly basis. Sometimes it's less often because the underlying data uh, only change uh, more slowly than that. We pick up a change when they, when they release them. And you can see here that these are all variants that have phenotypic association, and each database has a, uh, uh, a subset, uh, and none of them has all of the variants that are available. You can see this session live by looking at this URL, and I intend to come back to it later and look at it. And you can see in real time uh, what the browser would look like um, at this location with these data sets turned on. Uh, Okay, maybe it's not quite true anymore that it was just released. It's been released for about, an, uh, for about a year. Uh, we now have support for HGVS. So if you obtain a variant from some source that's uh, listed in terms of RefSeq followed by a nucleotide uh, change, you can go straight to the browser simply by copy-pasting that in there or uh, uh, typing that in there. You can also use a number of other formats, some of which are not actually legitimate HGVS according to the nomenclature people. But we figure if you're looking for a particular spot, we'll take you there, even if you're not using perfect HGVS. So you can even put in uh, 
P744 for BRCA1, for example, and it will take you to the 744th amino acid. Uh, of course, there are multiple isoforms, and so we choose the one that um, RefSeq has chosen as their canonical uh, isoform. It may not be the amino acid you're actually looking for. It's a little better to use this type of format because if 744 is not an alanine, the software will look to find an alanine out of 744 and take you to that isoform instead. Here's so I a have a list question. Of... Sorry. Yes, um, thank you. Um, so you said this is Deb. Um, you said this is just released. Was this wh when was it released? This is great because this uh, constantly when we're reading papers we get this kind of format and then I don't know the genomic one so I haven't even tried going to the browser for that recently. But um, okay, it's been around about a year now I think. Uh, so I'm oh happy to God. hear this is great. I actually have heard that Wonderful. before. <laughs> Um, we, on the browser, we have an announcement page that it's not a bad idea to sign up for. It's two or three announcements a month at the most. And okay. you might not be interested in knowing when we release a new baboon uh, genome assembly, but when we release a new feature like this, we typically announce it there. And so um, Great. it's a feature worth having. And in fact, this came out of a workshop. I taught an afternoon workshop at um, uh, Bar Harbor, um, Johns Hopkins Mammalian Geno uh, Genetics course a couple of summers ago. And at lunch, I was talking to one of the students who was a clinical geneticist out of Baylor uh, in Houston, and she had a particular variant she was interested in. And she had it in this nomenclature, and it took us a half an hour to find it because her gene had four or five isoforms. We go to the nucleotide, we try to figure out, you know, what's the starting cord, and let's add this number to it, and, you know, ah, oh, though that's not the wrong amino acid or something, back and forth, and then there's strandedness issues and so forth. And so when I came home, I, I really raised the profile. It was already on our to-do list, but the HTVS nomenclature uh, got a big boost from that because neither one of us really liked spending a half an hour doing that. And I was a little embarrassed we couldn't do it faster. And so now it works in a lot of different formats. So if you go to this link here, it outlines which formats are supported. And we're kind of trying to grow that list, but some of the more complicated ones may never may never show up. Some of the real weird uh, translocations or uh, you know strange multigenic things or multinucleotide things. Uh, we also have HGVS output from our tool, the Variant Annotation Integrator. Uh, if you choose the RefSeq set of genes, then HGVS becomes an option, and you can include genomic, cDNA, or protein, uh, or all of them in the, uh, in the output. And I hope to get a chance to show you that this morning. Uh, here's another uh, output uh, type from the uh, variant annotation integrator, and it shows the number of different types of um, uh, pathogenicity predictors, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, for uh, that you can include in the output. We have a number of different, uh, another, a number of other ones that we want to include. I've been hearing CADD, the CAD output, uh, in at meetings um, uh, more often uh, recently, and so I think that's the most, uh, the one that we want to put most in the uh, pipeline next. And that's kind of an aggregator. It sort of uses various algorithms to make a prediction, and people are starting to use that as well. So we have data sets for a lot of different purposes, as I implied on one of my earlier slides. Um, the output from microarrays uh, typically is going to be large uh, copy number variants. Uh, we have a database for benign uh, CNVs called DGV and pathogenic databases for uh, uh, microarrays for large ones, OMIM, ClinVar, and Decipher all uh, uh, have that, that kind of data. Uh, from whole exome sequencing, you're going to get a lot of uh, uh, SNPs in the coding sequence, and for benign, we have a number of different data tracks, including uh, EXAC, uh, uh, 1,000 genomes. Um, we have a track called Common SNPs, which we pull out of as a subset from the All SNPs track, and so the benign ones are present in both locations. Uh, Nomad, we're still working on. It's a large data set. We haven't uh, haven't released it yet. Um, it's a an outgrowth of the EXAC project at uh, at the Broad, and. Uh, for pathogenic, we have all SNPs, of course, which has everything. Uh, we also have OMIM alleles, which is a subset. Uh, we have the public version of HGMD, um, and we have Uniprot, which is an amino acid level uh, 
uh, variation database. If you see a variant in an amino acid, it's nice to know that someone else has seen it and it's got a phenotype and so forth. So you can click through it, uh, to it on the browser. And from whole genome sequencing, you get SNPs all over the place. And in many cases, it's not a whole lot better than whole exome sequencing because it's a lot of speculation in a lot of these other places whether or not a hit in a DNA hypersensitivity site is going to be pathogenic or not. Um, each one of those hits is a, a research project and it's uh, uh, on its own. And so from the clinical perspective, not a lot of whole genome sequencing uh, is happening yet uh, where the, uh, you get the most bang for the buck out of whole exome sequencing. So here's a grid showing the kind of the uh, display of the various types of data in a benign to pathogenic axis and the large versus small axis in the center here are some uh, databases that have, uh, um, have both uh, benign and uh, pathogenic variant. Um, a very brief look at the architecture of the browser. The short version is we suck data in, we provide it on our CGI, and we give you links to the offsite resources. Um, you can download the data directly if you're bioinformatically inclined. Uh, you can load your own data on the browser uh, by putting data into a track hub, which allow us to load it into the browser from some remote location. And so we don't have to interact directly with the data. We have way more data coming in nowadays than we have engineers to deal with it. And so we've made it possible for uh, research groups to bypass us entirely. For example, the uh, epigenomics blueprint uh, roadmap project, which is uh, similar to the ENCODE project, but separately funded, uh, has a data hub. The data are not integrated directly into the browser. Um, the new ENCODE projects, uh, phase three and phase four, are being uh, curated at uh, uh, Stanford, no longer at UCSC the way phase two was. They generate these track hubs uh, on the fly so that if you're interested in certain data sets, they will load them into the browser on the fly and give you a link uh, on the browser. Okay, so at this point, I want to switch over to uh, the genome browser itself. And uh, let's see, let's go, whoa, what's going on there? Let's go to the main index page first, okay? And I'll pause for a second for questions before I plunge into the, uh, the live demo. Okay, on this page, uh, we have links to some of our tools. The main tool is the genome browser itself. If you're interested in our uh, mailing list, you can see that uh, two in January so far, a couple in uh, December, you can subscribe by clicking on that link. And uh, we have some new mappability data for HG38 uh, and uh, primate conservation track there. So you would get an announcement that would read um, this is the uh, uh, the announcement. So each announcement is just a short email. Uh, in December, we had one, two, three, four, five. That was a busy month. Trying to get things done before the holidays, I guess. Everybody got everything out at once. Uh, so I'm going to click on the genomes link here, which is the same as clicking on the genome browser link on the uh, that other page. And if you're playing along, and I encourage you to do so, uh, whoops. I didn't mean to click that. Let's go back to the genomes. And uh, the first thing I would ask you to do is reset all user settings so we start at the uh, uh, same location. Uh, that throws away any browsing you may have done. I'm sorry for that. I apologize if you wanted to get back to that page. I will show you a way to save your pages in the future so you don't lose it if you go somewhere else. Um, this link over here, View Sequences, gives you a look at the genome uh, assembly, kind of the gross parameters of the assembly. Uh, we default to HD38 in human, but we have a number of different uh, older ones. If you're reading a paper that refers to an older reference assembly, the coordinates will be different. And so you can go to those browsers. Each uh, assembly has a different set of annotations on it, and usually the most recent is the best except that there are a lot of data on HG19 that never got lifted to HG38. And I've spoken to many, many people who are using HG19 primarily. And so that's what I intend to do as well. But before I do, I want to point out on HG38 um, that there are a number of sequences uh, that are new to HG38 that are not in 
uh, HG19, and that's the uh, series of alt sequences. They're trying to uh, expand the G uh, reference assembly to include data uh, from populations that are not in the same, you know, ethnic category as the people who donated the original samples. Because no matter who you choose, you're leaving a lot of people out in some of these hypervariable regions. So I'll just jump back to the genomes uh, page there, switch to HG19, and hit the Go button to go um, to the default location with the default tracks turned on. Uh, one of the things that you notice right away is we have a number of different data sets, kind of a blizzard of them. One of the things I usually do is simply use the hide all button uh, to get rid of them uh, so that it starts with a simple uh, uh, image. But before I do that, I want to point out the conservation score here. Um, you'll see this is multi-Z alignment of 100 vertebrates. Um, we display about eight of them here, but if you click into the configuration button over here on the left side, uh, it will turn all of them on, uh, or it gives you an op option to turn on any set you like. So if I turn all of them on, then you've got this entire list of species here. And if I submit that without changing any of the other uh, uh, parameters, you see that the uh, exons that are represented here by these uh, uh, peaks and up here by these uh, uh, boxes are pretty well conserved. In fact, I'm going to highlight this one exon. I'll put a little bit of intron around it by selecting it. And you do that by anywhere up in the top section here, where up in the coordinate space. You select that space. You have an option to change the colors if you like with a full, whoops, with a full on color picker. So I'll select that and I'll highlight it so that when I zoom down the page, we don't lose track of where we are. That's handy if you're looking at a particular uh, codon or particular nucleotide and you want to see other data. So you scroll down here, you can see that the exons are actually fairly obvious for this gene because it's conserved very far back. If you click into the gene here, you can read uh, the details about it, uh, including that this is a uh, uh, an enzyme that converts superoxide radicals to oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. So it's a, uh, a safety mechanism for the cell living in an oxygen environment. Uh, and it's been conserved all the way back to uh, birds and fish. Uh, you can also see that uh, in this GTEx data set right here, which when I put my mouse over the left side here, it highlights the data track in, uh, in green. And you can see that all of these different tissues are um, expressing uh, the uh, particular, uh, uh, this particular gene. It's the only place on the browser where the display is not in sync with the coordinate space. So you can see we have this whole set of graphs for this gene, and we have, over here we have a whole set of graphs for uh, this other gene, which doesn't show up in this gene set at all up here. Um, and so if we zoom in or out, the graphic does not, uh, does not change. So if I take this one region here, center it on that exon, and zoom in, you'll see that the GTEx uh, track uh, looks the same, even though everything else has expanded so that it fits uh, uh, the new coordinate space. Uh, using my right mouse button over here, I'm going to uh, hide the uh, conservation score. And I'm going to um, jump to another gene, which gives you kind of an interesting look at the GTEx track before I turn it off, the ATP1A3 gene. Any gene, when you type it in the position box here, you have the option of clicking through uh, in the pull-down menu and go directly to the gene. There's a ton of other stuff you can uh, type in there, including HGVS nomenclature. And this particular gene uh, shows us that it's expressed. These yellow ones are all brain. And you can see that there's a couple of other places where this ATPase, uh, atrial appendage, left ventricle, uh, pituitary, and uh, uh, testis. So if you're looking at a variant that's associated with a phenotype, uh, it's nice to be able to see which tissues that uh, gene, if, if it's in a gene, of course, uh, which tissues that gene uh, is expressed in. Because if it's not expressed in the gene, in the tissue where the phenotype is, then that strengthens the argument that it's not responsible for the phenotype you're looking at. Okay, so 
we have a number of different zoom versions. You can zoom into an amino acid, uh, I'm sorry, zoom into a, uh, an exon just by selecting it. At this resolution, you can see the, where the codons are in alternating lights and darks. And if you zoom even closer to just a small number of, of uh, uh, codons, then you can see that we have the amino acid name and the amino acid number, which is not going to be the same in all isoforms especially if you're downstream like we are here, 800 amino acids uh, away. Uh, but it does, if you're looking at the literature, help you understand which isoform the authors of the paper were referring to because some of these amino acids will match and some of them won't. Um, I would like to refer you back to um, the link that I showed you uh, um, on an earlier slide, this top one here, bit.ly slash ClinGen2018. So I'm going to flip over back here to Firefox, uh, open up bit.ly slash ClinGen2018. And I just want to click on this link here, hgvstext.txt, just to give us a couple of HGVS um, items that we can copy paste into the uh, uh, into the browser. That way you can copy paste them if you're following along uh, without having to try to scribble them down quickly off my screen. So jumping back to the browser here, if I simply paste that HGBS uh, term in there, here we are at this particular nucleotide with five nucleotides on either side for, uh, uh, for padding. And then this particular nucleotide represents a C but you'll notice back over here that it's a G to T, right? And that's because the NM underscore 198 blah, 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 is a RefSeq that's on the bottom strand. It's transcribed uh, right to left. And you can see that by the numbers of the amino acid, 416, 417, 418. So it's a G in the RefSeq, but it's a C on the reference assembly. If you want to see it the other way, you can click on this little arrow up here on the left side and now it's, it shows you that it's going, uh, it's reading right to left in the same sense that the gene is. If you want to switch the whole screen, you can reverse the whole screen here using the reverse button. The reverse button will flip the image and put the labels on the right side to remind you that it's flipped. It flips this ideogram here, which puts the center mirror to the right of center instead of left of center, because the standard is to have the P arm on the left. Um, and so now with the reverse button turned on, it's the P arm is to the right. And you'll see that now we have flipped the, uh, uh, the reading direction of the, uh, the arrow here as well. So I'm going to flip it back. In fact, they put that in the browser for me when I first joined the group because I was a molecular biologist, not a bioinformatician. Actually, I'm still not. Um, and the uh, idea of looking at a gene transcribed backwards just drove me nuts. So Mark Decons, one of our engineers, um, put that into the browser so that you can flip the orientation. If you spend all your time looking at one gene, left to right, five prime to three prime, uh, uh, it might be comforting for you. Uh, I've gotten over it, though. I, I'm OK now with uh, doing it uh, the other way. Uh, speaking of um, uh, P arm and Q arm, you can also type something in like 12Q12. And if that actually is a cytoband, we're going to find out in a second here. It will open up the browser. Here you are at Q12 on chromosome 12. It opens up our um, cytoband uh, um, display track. So it's chromosome 12, Q12. So you can jump directly to any of the, uh, uh, the cytobands. You'll see here that some of the genes on the screen have a lot of isoforms on them. Um, we have a configuration option. I use my right mouse button here to pop up this uh, option. You can also get to it by clicking on the uh, little button on the left. And you can turn off the splice variance. And so if you're looking at a large region, then you – whoops. Oh, yeah, okay. So I turned them off for the UCSC genes track. I did not turn them off for the RefSeq genes track. So here's the RefSeq. I will simply hide that, that track there. And so here's all the little GTEx. At this resolution, the uh, transcription uh, uh, levels are a little bit harder to read. So I'm going to hide that track as well. Um, we have a number of different ways of loading data into the browser. So I want to 
hide everything right now. Hit the hide all button. I'll turn you CSC genes back on to pack. Uh, pack is simply a way of loading as many pieces of data onto the screen in a small space uh, as we can. And I switch from pack to full. You'll see that each gene gets its own uh, line. The labels are all over here in a stack. And uh, it just kind of uses up a lot of uh, screen real estate. Uh, full is handy for a, uh, a track that gives you a second dimension if you're looking at a, a signal, a transcription signal from uh, a BAM file or something like that then you might be interested in uh, um, uh, full mode. Um, it's as good a time as any to show you all of the different data types that we have going down the page. If you're interested in uh, regulation, we have a lot of encode data here uh, that shows some of the places where um, transcription factor binding sites have been identified or histone modification. Here's an RNA uh, binding, uh, transcription factor binding site here, uh, enhancers. Uh, and so forth. Uh, in a clinical setting, as I said earlier, it's a little bit difficult to determine uh, um, with uh, with certainty that a particular region is a uh, is pathogenic. Um, but we also have a number of different uh, SNP versions. Um, we put common SNPs first uh, because we want people to notice that uh, they're available. Uh, it's actually only about 10% of the total uh, from the all SNPs uh, data set from dbSNP. Uh, in addition, we have 1,000 genomes data. Uh, we have individual genome variants. That's where uh, Craig Venter and J uh, James Watson and Marjolein Creek are, uh, are loaded. Uh, we have exact data, uh, uh, EVS, uh, exon variant uh, 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 data there as well. Um, the uh, difficulty of understanding where all the data are uh, is a challenge that we have, it's, it's a problem we have, haven't actually solved, but we're working on trying to make it as uh, easy to learn how data uh, are in the browser as possible. Uh, if you put your uh, uh, mouse over any of these labels, you can see the, what we call the long label. And so these are uh, identified by dbSNP as clinically associated, which really only means they've been contributed by a locus specific database. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're uh, pathogenic in any way. Uh, mostly it means that they're in a gene that can be pathogenic when particular modifications of that gene uh, are present in a, uh, in a patient. So if I scroll back up to the top of the page, it's actually possible using this configure button right here to see the long label of all of the data sets at once in a stack. So it's a little easier than putting your mouse over each one of them. So you can see the short label on the left and the right label on the, uh, I'm sorry, the long label on the right. And you can actually turn the tracks on um, right here um, simply by uh, switching that from, uh, uh, from hide to pack or so, and then hit submit. Uh, so a gene reviews, uh, as I'm sure you're aware of, and uh, this group is a uh, authoritative articles. Uh, solicited by NCBI, written by experts that sh um, describe genes that have been associated with uh, phenotypes. And for any one of these genes, you click into the item, then you click into the, uh, the link there, and it opens up the page at Gene Reviews, and you can read the article. Uh, this one here was uh, last updated uh, three, four years ago. Uh, usually when we open up a new window to an outside source, we open up a fresh tab or a fresh window so that you can close it without losing the, uh, your location at the browser. So I want to go back to the genome browser here and uh, show you, uh, I told you that I wanted to show you how to load uh, your own data into the browser. So let's go back to that other page. Um, here's another version you can play with on your own. You can copy paste that or any other gene and a P for protein. Uh, with the coordinates into the browser and use that for navigation. So clicking back here, I want to show you this uh, a CT examples. This is a file that has a number of different custom track types. So I'm simply going to select all and copy and then go back to the genome browser and use this button here, add custom tracks. It's also available here under my data custom tracks is the pull down menu. The custom tracks input page lets you put data into the browser. 
And in its simplest format, you don't even need a name. A bed three file is simply G, uh, Chrome, Chrome Start, and Chrome End. It's a three, uh, a three field data file that lets you draw a box on the browser. So if I submit this, it loads these four data tracks into the browser. And then if I click uh, onto the top one there, uh, we're taken to the browser at the coordinates of the first item in the track. And so you can see here that it's possible to load any data into the browser to mark any genomic coordinate. You can also uh, put in any data with a uh, uh, second dimension. If you've seen a, a particular variant six times, you can put it into a file that has the coordinates and a number six next to it, and then that'll give you the, uh, uh, the height of the track uh, uh, or a bar at the height of number six. So you can use that as a way internally to keep track of Oh my God! I've seen in this one this one again. So, increment the number in your um, in your data set, load it into the browser, and then when you see it, you go, "Oh yeah, look at this! I've seen this many, many times." Um, and so your uh, your graphic, your browser can uh, um, uh, can display that. Um, we have this data type down here called PG SNP, and it's a modification of. I'm flip, flipping back to this track. It's a modification of the BAM uh, file. I'm sorry, of the BED file. Uh, that has a few extra data fields in them. Uh, uh, it's very easy to make up such a file. The only thing that's necessary is that if you have two alleles, you have to have two numbers in these other two columns. And they can be 0, 0. Uh, for other purposes, of course, you might want to have different numbers. It might be the number of mice in a, an experiment with one phenotype versus, or a genotype versus the other genotype, something like that. But the simplest is just zero comma zero. But the value of that format is that it becomes uh, raw material for our variant annotation integrator. So this is a tool that lets you load in any set of variants. Say, for example, you've gone through a lot of our data sets. None of these variants has been seen before, or you haven't, haven't found it in any of the other data sets. This tool will let you use a number of different gene predictors for uh, uh, the gene models, and then it uses those gene models to predict the effect of the variants. So if we select RefSeq genes as a, uh, uh, a, a gene set, we scroll down the page. Uh, this is a live version of the slide I showed you, with, which had all of these options uh, selected. You can see that you can see DNA cypersensitivity and transcription factor binding as options. You can check those if you like. I'm simply going to use the defaults here. And scrolling down here, you see the HGVS variant nomenclature. Um, whoops. Whoops, where is it? OK, my SNP custom tracks. Jan Kuhn, I must have selected the wrong one by accident. If you select RefSeq up here, then HGVS becomes an option. And you can have the cDNA and um, protein coordinates output using the RefSeq uh, gene models. Uh, you can also get it in genomic coordinates, which are, it's kind of circular because you already have the genomic coordinates or you wouldn't have a data track. So that's not an output to format I typically use or recommend because uh, you're getting your own data right back. The output here, if you put it in HTML, it becomes a handy uh, view on the screen. If you want to import it into a spreadsheet, then you probably want to export as tab separated text so that then you could load it, you could uh, open it up in uh, uh, Excel. So if I get um, results, then we click on that disclaimer and let it work through that file. And it uses uh, the RefSeq genes as a uh, raw material to make predictions. Um, I should mention that there's two types of output for the variant annotation integrator, uh, that PG SNP format that I just showed you, and VCF format. Uh, we're working on making plain old bed format uh, work as well, so that uh, a simple bed file that just has coordinates in it uh, will be useful. So you'll see from uh, this output, uh, the same variant here shows up many times. And that's because this tool gives you an output for every isoform. Uh, that's particularly useful at places where a variant may be in an exon in one isoform, but an intron in other isoforms, uh, because it's good to know that. It might be tissue specific 
whether or not that variant has any effect or not, whether or not that variant has any effect. And so to know that it's different from one isoform versus another uh, is useful. You'll also notice that this particular one, because it's not in a uh, coding region, it's upstream from one gene, downstream from another gene nearby, and it gives us information how far away from the gene is it in those two directions. And you can see here that the cDNA, uh, uh, this particular, it looks like it's in the uh, uh, untranslated region here because it's minus 49 coordinate relative to the uh, start of uh, translation. Down here where you're in a coding region, it tells you that it's an exon one of six, that it's a valanine three, uh, I'm sorry, a valine three to alanine. So it's amino acid three, valine to alanine, and this particular nucleotide has changed. It's the middle nucleotide of the, uh, uh, the codon. So it's nucleotide number eight in the cDNA and number 48 in the, uh, um, well, number 48 in the cDNA, number eight in the, uh, the coding region. Um, we use a uh, uh, version of uh, annotation called uh, sequence ontology, the SO terms, um, to describe this. And there are a number of other software tools that use those, uh, those same tools. Uh, here you can see an in-frame insertion. Uh, it puts an, uh, an arginine in here by adding a CGG. Uh, there's one down here, I believe. It's, here's a frame shift. Uh, let me just search the page here for uh, the word splice. Okay, there we go, splice donor variant. This particular variant then is at uh, a splice site right next to a, uh, an exon. So that gives you the raw material then to uh, help identify which uh, types of uh, variation you have for particular uh, uh, changes. Uh, we hope to at some point uh, make these uh, columns sortable. Uh, you could load them into a spreadsheet and sort them yourself, of course, which makes it uh, uh, easy to put all your missense together so you can get your low-hanging fruit uh, 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 more easily. Uh, I'm going to uh, go over to the uh, See my data, custom tracks, and uh, turn off all of these custom tracks. So I'll, I'll check all of them and delete them, and then go back to the, uh, the genome browser. So I mentioned earlier in uh, one of my static slides that there's a way to save sessions. Um, here under my sessions, we have a, a link that brings you to a login page. So I created a login for uh, these particular webinars called ClinGen 2018 Password Genome. And I can save that. And this is a way to save a particular view of the screen so that you can uh, come back and visit it again. So let's say we uh, save these current sessions. We'll just call it ClinGen 1 for the moment and submit. So now we have a, uh, uh, a saved version of what the screen looked like when we were, uh, when we were looking at it. Uh, it's a little bit boring at the moment, at this particular uh, view, because it has only one gene in the window and no other data sets. You can see that this gene has no gene reviews article for it. Um, if a track is turned on but there are no data, the label will still appear in the image so that you'll know that there's no data for that particular gene set. Uh, rather than turn it off, then you won't necessarily know if you've got it on or not. Uh, so I want to use that session mode to go back to this other page. This is the bit.ly page that I uh, gave you earlier. And uh, use this database links HTML, this middle link on that page, to show you a page of some sessions that I have saved so that uh, you can look at this grid, this coordinate system, and essentially turn on a number of relevant uh, data sets for each uh, particular uh, uh, scenario. So let's say, uh, let's use this one down here, the lower left corner, small and pathogenic, and you can see that the link is up here in this grid. If we click on small and pathogenic, it opens up the browser, at a location with particular gene sets turned on that were exactly the way 
that is if it continues to load here, um, the way they were when I saved the session. Okay, let me try that again and see if... Oh, that is very weird. Okay, let's go... Let's go to Genome Euro. And we'll use that same session as a backup here. So I'm just going to copy the link back over here. And, oh, okay, never mind. What did it do here? Okay, so here's the link. I'm going to type Euro in here. Okay, so that opens the session that that other link should have opened up. Let me test it one more time just to see if it was just a uh, transient gremlin. Oh, I can imagine our engineers are tearing their hair out at this at the moment if they see something like that. Um, so this is actually a version of the, the updated version of that slide, that static slide I showed you earlier. You can see that the thousand genomes uh, is very dense at this location, and we've saved um, uh, the link showing these different data sets. So once you established for yourself that you're in a region that, uh, you know, that, that you have the right data sets for a particular function uh, present, then you can save a session and you can always get back to that session. So this is a live session and it's showing us a number of different um, uh, uh, data tracks turned on, and we can, for example, uh, navigate to the BRCA1 gene and uh, jump directly to the BRCA1 gene with those same uh, same links turned on, or the, I'm sorry, the same tracks turned on. So we can go to my data, my sessions. Now, any one of you now can say, now that we're on the Euro machine, my earlier session is missing, but we can save settings here. We can call this ClinGen2, submit that, and uh, uh, get back to that. I'm going to pop back over to this other page and click on this link and see. Oh, that is ugly. Okay, we're going to stick with Euro for now. Um, we had some hardware failures a couple of days ago that uh, have been bedeviling our engineers. We were actually down for 16 minutes yesterday, which caused a flurry of emails in our uh, uh, our, um, our mailing list. If that happens to you, you can always jump over to Genome Euro. Uh, with the caveat that your safe sessions are not saved over there anymore. So it's handy. So now that we're at BRCA1, let's do a little uh, trick here. So let's go to, to my sessions. We'll save this one as HT19 underscore Clin uh, Gen 3. So now we've saved it. You can also save your settings, and that's something I actually recommend people do so they don't lose track of them. Um, Clin Gen 3. You can save it to a file. So if you simply submit that, you can save the file on your uh, desktop anywhere. I'll just pop it into this spreadsheet here. Let's see, where are we? ClinGen webinar, ClinGen 3, save. So now I have a hard copy of the, uh, the session. So if UCSC goes down, which we're going to when we have the next big earthquake, um, you can go over to Genome Euro save your sessions over, or load your sessions over there, and you haven't lost them. If we have a massive hardware failure and we lose our local copy of your sessions, then you haven't lost them if you go to uh, uh, your file and reload them. So it's easy to pop these sessions back and forth. You can save uh, a session anywhere you like by uh, uh, saving them to a file, loading them to Euro, loading them to Genome Asia, or loading them to UCSC. 
So let's flip back over to here and we'll grab this one, this large pathogenic. And I want to copy the link, open this one here, save the link, go home, change the link to Genome Euro. See, I took the precaution of saving the sessions in both locations um, using my uh, uh, so let's see, and you can see at the bottom of the screen here, I don't have any way to point to the bottom of the screen while my mouse is hovering over the uh, the link. But you can see at the bottom that it says other username equals example, and other user session name is HD19 underscore large path. So that's the name that the session has back at the browser and it's stored in our database. Um, you'll see here that I saved this when the screen was a little narrower and it's possible to adjust the width of uh, any uh, of the of the browser view simply by hitting resize and it will get wider or narrower with a little bit of blue space on the edge depending on the size of your screen so it'll get as wide as your screen uh, is at any particular time so this particular location is on the telomere of the uh, Q arm of chromosome 10 uh, the coordinates are here, the size of the region is there, and you can see that we have a number of genes in the region. So here I have uh, a number of data sets turned on. So here's the ClinGen CNVs benign, shows that certain regions here have been uh, curated and classified as benign. Um, any one of them can be clicked into, um, and this is good, as good a time as any to describe that when you if you're looking at a track and you say, I wonder what blue means, or I wonder what red means, you may have noticed that I clicked into a red one. Usually you can click down and scroll on the page and look for a spot where the colors are described. It should be described on every one of our details pages at the bottom of the page somewhere. Red is a loss of copy number and blue is gain. At the top from this uh, horizontal line here and above, you get data that are specific to the individual item that you just clicked on. So you can see the ClinGen details are here. If I click into that, it opens up a fresh window, goes over to uh, NCBI, and opens up a window uh, on that particular item. Okay, I will just press that. Gives you the coordinates of that position, gives you the size. A lot of times they, uh, that particular item will be off the screen, and it'd be nice to know how big it actually is if you're zoomed in. Uh, you might not uh, appreciate just how big the uh, the variant is. So looking into the, the uh, browser link to go back here, you can see that this particular region has been annotated once as being benign for a uh, uh, copy number uh, uh, reduction with for a uh, micro deletion. Uh, over here, you've got a big region that's been uh, annotated as uh, benign uh, multiple times. Uh, you might be suspicious of a single annotation that's benign here um, if it's only shown up once. Down below, we have some other data tracks turned on. So these are the pathogenic gene set. Um, and you can see that these, uh, many of them run off the screen. This little double-headed arrow here, if you click it, it'll take you to the left edge of this item. Now, the item may be really big, and so you may, may, uh, may not want to click over there. If I click into the, this, uh, remember we're at 1.2 uh, uh, megabases. This particular item is 13 megabases. So you've got 90% uh, of this item is not on the screen. It's shown off, off the screen to the left. Uh, and of course, that uh, points up the uh, some of the difficulty for evaluating these large da uh, data sets. Just because uh, this one overlaps this region here, doesn't mean that a small deletion in this region is pathogenic if the larger one is uh, for uh, obvious reasons because there are so many genes in the uh, 13 kilobase region that are not present in this uh, 100 kilo, I'm sorry, 13 megabase region that are not present in this uh, region right here. Let me just highlight this region right here again. And just for, uh, for grins, we'll pick a different color. We'll pick some that's dark green here. And uh, so we'll scroll down the page. 
and you can see that that overlaps uh, uh, quite a number of annotations that have been identified as pathogenic, uh, including this one here, which is not much bigger than the region I just uh, uh, just highlighted. So I'm sure you're aware that a lot of data sets have uh, a number of different, uh, um, I guess, noise in them or uh, fuzzy data where um, the older they are, perhaps the less formed the curators were when they when they made the prediction, and that uh, we constantly have to uh, uh, update our databases. So it looks like uh, we're running out of time. So in the final two minutes, I, I will uh, quiet myself and give you a chance to ask some questions. So thanks for your attention. If you were attending, if you're all asleep, I apologize. Um, this uh, kind of one-way presentation style is a little bit weird for me, but uh, 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 thanks for being here. That's great. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, does anyone have any questions? And remember, um, Bob is going to join us again uh, in four weeks' time on February 22nd for part two of the UCSC uh, genome browser. So. Um, if there are any questions in the meantime, you can uh, feel free to ask them then. Yes. In fact, we have a mailing list if you have any questions. We have a, we have a question, I think, coming in. Is Great. it? Great. Rona here, and I have a quick question. That do you store a GVS expression in your database? Okay. I heard someone was speaking, but it was very faint. I could not hear it. Okay. Sorry about that. What okay. I was asking is, uh, do you store the GVS expression? Questions in your database, or uh, like you know, only the reference sequence that is present, uh, it is supported, or it, you can you know, it is pretty flexible in terms of. Uh, okay, it cut out right after you said store. Do we store what? Adjuvant was... expression. Yeah. Do you store the HGVS? It, 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 he's asking, do you store the HGVS expression um, terms in your database? And are they related, I think, to just the, the uh, canonical RESTIC, or how is that done? Uh, uh, do you mean the GTEx, the GTEx expression? No, the HGVS we, terminology. We do have a data table. I think for our mailing list. Over time, so we can contact uh, later. We, I'll send you a mail. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, HGVS are calculated on the fly using RefSeq, so we don't have any kind of way to look up any HGVS. Um, you could put in a track of uh, variants in PG SNP format, and it would export HGVS of via the variant annotation integrator. So that would be a way to get HGVS out of a particular coordinate system, um, you know, out of genomic coordinates and into HGVS ref coordinates. Um, but I understood that you would write the mailing list as well. One question to get more clarification on that? I think that clarifies what, what I was asking for. Thank you. I see. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had um, put up just a question about um, maybe add a, where we could ask to add in other functional tools. So for the ClinGen BioCurators, we've been using Revel um, a lot from Stanford. So I know that, I mean, you can't just add in all tools ever, but um, that's been a very useful one for us. So some consideration of that. And then CAD, you had mentioned, would be going in. And I know we've we've also used CAD as well. Um, found it useful. Okay, that, I'll add that to the endorsement list for our CAD. Uh, every time somebody asks for it, it becomes more um, urgent for us to add it. And what was the other right. one? Rebel, as in Confederate Rebel, -E Soldier, or Rebel with a yeah. V? Rebel with a V. With a V. Okay. <laughs> All right. I will uh, look into that. And you say that's from Stanford? Yes. Okay. I'll certainly add it to our list. I, I just saw the list yesterday, and we have maybe four or five tools that we're interested in uh, um, loading, uh, but 